Yes. Very good. Um, well, good afternoon or evening, depending on where you are um, all, and welcome to this webinar on book writing and editing uh, to mark the publication of the fourth edition of Wilmot Smith on construction contracts. Depending on how your screen is laid out, it, he's just below me. Um, I have form for saying that the speaker needs no introduction and then talking for 10 minutes. I promise I'm not going to do that because you don't want to hear from me, you want to hear from the panelists. Um, but I am going to just say a few words of introduction about the books that our panel this evening have written. Uh, there are four panelists, but three books. Um, first, uh, Wilmot Smith on construction contracts. The first edition uh, was in 2006, and of course, written by Richard Wilmot Smith QC, one of the most eminent construction silks. It recently reached its fourth edition, which this event marks, with Richard now joined as author by Paul Darling QC, uh, a man of like eminence. Um, the book has an enthusiastic foreword from Lord Justice Coulson, who is editor-in-chief of the White Book, and himself the author of Coulson on Construction Adjudication, first published in 2008, and now also in its fourth edition. And lastly, on an allied but slightly different topic, uh, we have the Rome 1 regulation on the law applicable to contractual obligations by Michael McParland QC. Um, there may only be one edition of this book published in 2015, but it was described by Lord Briggs as a marvellous book and a magnificent achievement. Um, all the panellists, before I hand over to them, are going to have to forgive me for starting by talking, however, about a completely different book. Um, because two of us, Paul Darling QC and me, had our first taste of book editing in the early 1990s, working on the fifth edition of Keating on Building Contracts, as it then was. Uh, and it seems to me for this afternoon's purposes are that that book is interesting and illustrative in this way. Um, a young barrister called Donald Keating was asked to lecture to architects on the basic law of contract and court, uh, which they would need to understand in the process of contract administration. Uh, he had a problem. He had no textbook to use uh, to, to, to teach them and to uh, base his lectures around. There was a textbook on building contracts, it was Hudson, but that was massively out of date. So the young Donald Keating decided to write his own book. Um, it went through four editions, was very successful, but then it too became out of date uh, and was at risk of becoming the next Hudson, an out-of-date textbook. It was saved by the editorship of Anthony May and a team that included Paul and me, which, as I said, is how we first got our introduction to book writing and book editing. Um, so that's the story of how that book came to be written and how it came to be updated. Uh, it kicks off, I think, our first uh, question or my first question to the panel, which is what motivated you to write a book and to write a book on the topic that you chose. Uh, and I'm going to throw that question out first to Lord Justice Coulson. Well, the honest answer to that question is flattering. Uh, I was sitting in my chambers, not that long after I became a judge, um, um, doing whatever it is judges do, uh, and the phone rang and it was uh, a woman from OUP who said she was doing market research into my area of the law and trying to find out if there were any areas of my area of the law that needed or could benefit from textbooks. So I said, well, the obvious answer is adjudication because it's a new area of law and there are lots of cases and there's no textbook. And it's a really good opportunity for somebody to write a, a textbook and gather all the cases together. And she said, oh, well, a lot of people have said that. So I thought, well, why are you asking me? And then she said, and they've all said that you should write it. So obviously, as a result of this 
shameful flattery, I said, what a good idea. Uh, and um, I, I said, yes. Um, and that was before I became a high court judge. And I, I was able to schedule the time. Rupert Jackson, who was my boss effectively in the TCC at the time, thought it was a very good idea. So he was very supportive. And so um, one summer, I sat down and wrote it. Uh, and obviously there were times during the writing of it when I wish I'd not been so easily flattered uh, and uh, so easily persuaded to do it. But it, 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 it was because it, it was a, a, a good opportunity and somebody said I should do it. So I took their hand off and did it. Good. Um, Mike, were you, were you flattered into writing a book as well or did it come about another way? And you're still on mute. No, still muted. Still on mute, Michael. Can you hear me now? Sorry. There you go. There you go. Uh, how long has it been? Uh, sorry, how long? <laughs> how long has it been since we've all been learning to do this? Oh, I've forgotten. I, life before life before Zoom conferences is just ancient history for me. <laughs> now. There was a time we used to go to court. Do you remember that? And I do. Stand I do. in councils rows. Well, I was very happy to hear Lord Justice Coulson say that what motivated him was flatter was flattery, because that was exactly the same with me. I was rung up for my OUP. The only difference with my experience was twofold. One was drink. I had foolishly volunteered at a book launch party after a couple of baby shams and, and cocktail sausages to uh, would they be they asked me would it be interested in writing a book on choice of law in tort and I'd written off a quick 15 minute synopsis and then they rang me up and said well actually we've, we've already got a book choice of law in tort <laughs> would you like to write a book on the Rome one regulation choice of law of contract and I and I must admit I was flattered by that and that was um was I was a young man then, I was about five, and it's, the next 40 odd years were spent regretting being so easily impressed. Yeah, that's, that's interesting, because both of you have said that um, the subject area was identified for you by the publishers, uh, and to fill a space where there wasn't a text already. Um, so Richard, um, I'm guessing that the position with your uh, first edition was a bit different. No, it was the same. Yeah. Um, Rachel Mullally, the same uh, um, editor at OUP, I hope, is on this call. Uh, but I got two lunches out of it. The first lunch was where she mentioned that, um, well, she asked me the question, was there a gap in the market? And I said, I thought there probably was. Um, and I agreed then over a very good lunch to do it. But then I did nothing for six months. Um, and then two things happened. First of all, I went to visit a friend near Beverly and I stayed in a pub which had, you know, these pubs that have libraries. And I sat down to have a pint and I just looked around and there was the first, I kid you not, the first edition of Keating on building contracts mm -hmm. in a pub. It was just part of the wallpaper. And I opened it up while I was waiting for the person I was meeting to come. And I thought, my God, this is, this is how you know, this is how they should be. It was just brilliantly written and very personal. It was like somebody had taken you to one side to tell you what construction law was all about. And you were absolutely riveted by it. And so I was. And so I then rang up Rachel, got another lunch out of it, and then actually agreed to do it. Yeah, I'm going to bring Paul in on the next question, but but that's an interesting answer as well, because what you've just described is reading a book and seeing the personality come across from it and the clarity of writing come across from it. Uh, and I think you said it was like someone taking you to one side and saying, let me tell you all about construction law. So you obviously had to go through a process of then deciding how you yourself were going to take someone to one side what topics you were going to cover, how you were going to structure the book. What, what, yeah. what did that process involve? Uh, basically being bullied slightly by Rachel for an outline, which may, gave me the discipline. So I, I segmented the task into two. First of all, chapter headings, take them to one side. How, how would you structure the talk? What would you take first, second, third, fourth, fifth? 
is there a logic and then are there the little rag bags and then after that then there were the subheadings within within each chapter but the first and essential thing was each chapter heading uh, uh, sorry each chapter and then you come to the subheadings within each chapter is everyone else's experience similar or do you go about things in a in a different way yeah i i pre i preached it like a judgment i sat down i wrote out my outline for the chapters and then i wrote out the subheadings within the chapters exactly like that um and then fired up the dictating machine in the hope that it also sounded like somebody taking somebody aside and telling them about adjudication mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and hoping that they didn't nod off part way through obviously very unlikely, Peter. Very unlikely. Mike, did, same approach, or did it involve a dictaphone? That's that's a blast from the past. Well, I've only ever used that once, and once uh, Lord Jesus and I shared a, a pupil master who used a dictaphone all the time. But I only ever used it once in my life. But no, I had to use my fingers, unfortunately. The um, for me, the situation was rather different in that I was talking about a regulation of which there was no case law it was just come into force the, the background was probably obviously the convention in 1980 and that so i had to think long and hard as to well what do i want to who do i what do i want to give to people and the conclusion i reached is what i want is a, a book that enables me me as a practitioner to have at my fingertips what i might need to know if i need to construe this regulation on a friday night as to that so I, I spent a lot of time digging up all the travaux preparatoire from unreported negotiations in the Rome One Committee in Brussels as to the discussions of what should go in the text. So that took me a, a lot of time. So that was the difference. I had to decide, well, how am I going to approach this? And the answer was, I'm going to create a complete record of the evolution of this regulation and then project forward as to what I think is likely to be the interpretation given to it. Took me a long time to work that out, and Rachel Mullally, God bless her, was uh, very patient with me because without her, it would never, it would never have got off the ground. Because I think one lesson I learned for as a practitioner entering into a private international law field is that's the realm of academics, that's their pitch, and so when you put in your little your proposal as Richard did, the academics will look at it and they'll come back. And while the practitioners were supportive of the proposed book, the, the academics, the responses were sort of, I don't know Michael Mappal, and I've seen he's been in some cases. I don't wish to be rude, but he's a barrister, so he's probably barely literate. <laughs> it was that sort of reaction to it. So thanks to Rachel for keeping me keeping on the straight and narrow. But, but again, um, what, what I think you've picked up on in that is that you saw yourself writing a book for practitioners. Yes. Taking the book into court, as you say, it's a late Friday, you're in court on Monday, what do I need to know? Um, I, I think I haven't, put, I haven't given, it's, it's extraordinary. I've managed to keep Paul Darling quiet for about 15 minutes. I don't think I've ever achieved that before. Um, but I think I'll throw the next question there for Paul, which is when, when you became involved in, um, Wilmot Smith on construction contracts with Richard. Um, what was the discussion between you? Is this a book for practitioners? Did you see it that way or did you see it as an academic treatise? Um, what, what, what was your approach? Well, first thing is he just said, get it updated, um, was the first. Uh, but no, but I, I think we see it very much as a, a textbook for practitioners uh, and those who want to be directed to the right starting place to look at these areas of law. Um, we don't regard it as a academic treatise um, and it is also intended to be um, starting in many places from scratch rather than evolved over many editions so I think it, it's a it's meant to be um, I think very much what um, Peter was describing for his book and what Michael was describing for, for his as well okay um, well you you've you've led to the next obvious topic which is the book's written uh, and it's, as I said before at the beginning, with uh, something like Hudson or Keating, it's in danger of going out of date because the law keeps changing. I mean, these pesky judges keep deciding cases uh, and Parliament keeps passing new legislation. I mean, how, you know, how inconsiderate. Um, so you, you've got to have another go at it. Um, it, it is do you do you feel you've got to have another go at it or could you just say i've written the, the perfect 
uh, tome on this subject, and I'm going to leave it be now. Do you feel Do you feel obliged to update it for your reading public, um, Peter? Let's start with you again. Uh, yes, um, you obviously you have to. Uh, you can't keep updating it, so you 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 have to choose a sort of reasonable period of time to go by. But you do have to keep updating it because uh, the law changes. Uh, and um, sometimes people say that you've got it wrong or that the judge has got it wrong. Amazing though that may sound. And so so what, what you've said in the first edition as to the law is then said by the Court of Appeal or the Supreme Court to be wrong. So you have to then um, delete reference to that case or explain that that case has been overturned as a result of some other decision. So you do have to uh, uh, update it. And uh, that is the one thing that I would say to anybody who's thinking about writing that, and I would encourage everybody to do it, but it is the one thing that I would say to people, don't underestimate the amount of work that's involved in updating a textbook because especially one that you're aiming at practitioners because there are textbooks out there and we've all seen them which you can tell what they've done in the updating it's the same it's exactly the same text and then there's a few paragraphs stitched on to the end and um, I am conscious that that is a criticism which you could level at one or two bits of the white book and that's just not a helpful way to do it. But what it does mean is that an update can involve, depending on the how much change has been, a major rewrite. And there have been times when I have thought, oh, great, I've just got to update the book. That won't take very long. And that is a, a, a bad attitude because it bloody well does. If you're going to do it properly. I don't know if Richard's experience is the same. I mean, he went to the drastic, the drastic straits of inviting Paul. So oh, he, he must also regard updating as, <laughs> as, as a hard task. But certainly that, that's what I've found. It is very rewarding because once you've done it, it is, it is there and it is, you know, perfect for them. But it is, it's much harder work than anybody tells you. It is. Before it, Richard answers that question, yeah. before you answer it, you will get a chance in a minute. Sorry. Um, I've got a direct question, Peter, for you, um, which is, is there a fifth edition in the pipeline? <laughs> yeah. um, I think there needs to be a fifth edition, um, and I would hope that um, I, if I was asked, by OUP, I would hope to do that next year. Now I'm no longer Deputy Head of Civil Justice. I have got some time that I otherwise spent doing that. So it is quite a good time to do it. And the, a lot has changed since um, 2017 when I wrote it. Oh, thank you. So, so the short answer is yes. Boo. Well, it's a flattering question to be asked, I think. So, so Richard, I, I stopped you answering um, Peter's question, which was, did you agree with him? Uh, what hard work it was and how much rewriting was required? It is hard work but and a huge amount of rewriting. The, I think it was the first lunch with, um, with Rachel. We discussed the competition and one of the problems with the competition was that the, each chapter gained new updates by way of what appeared to me to be barnacles you just shove a new case in shove a new case in until the character of the original disappeared and one of the purposes of the book was to make sure that it, it had a character like the person taking you to one side the two types of updating or two stages of updating the first is the mere assembly of the new cases but the second isn't just the bolting on of, um, of those new cases, but it's standing back and looking and saying, well, actually, I've got to rip up what happened uh, originally and change it and rewrite it completely. 
Uh, and the most obvious example, I think, between the first and the second edition, or between the second and the third, I forget which was taught. That it, that in that initial book or Where chapter. Sorry, was... sorry, where are we? Oh, sorry, that that just disappeared completely. And the fourth edition is by and large, um, by and large, re, re, all, altogether rewritten. But it's two stages. You've got you've got to do the base work of well what what has happened and then you stand back and you see the big picture and you realize well actually what happened is it isn't a bolt on it's a, it's a rewrite so what what parts of the well you said it's almost a complete rewrite but are there certain sections where you think either you've revisited what you wrote and felt it needed rewriting or the laws changed so much that you felt it needed rewriting both um, sometimes i just got a little bit too wordy Sometimes you could, when you stand back after a couple of years, you realize, actually, I shouldn't say it, but it, the errors you've made, not necessarily of substance, but of style or of, of direction. And you think, or, or even the way the case is looked at, and how you categorize it and how you order it. Okay. And you think, no, I've got, to, I've got to start again. And I think I, I, I'm going to ask Paul a question in, in a second on the back of that. But before I do, there's another question that's come up in the Q&A, which seems appropriate at this point, Richard, which is what part of the book are you most proud of? Oh, the one I didn't write. The, the one my son wrote. <laughs> the one on <laughs> unjust enrichment. Paul can say how good that is. Oh, marvellous. The uh, uh, absolutely, absolutely marvellous. So what I was going to ask you, Paul, was which bit did Richard let you loose on? Well, most of it. Um, no, the, the, we, we, we had help from... It, it was very much a collaborative exercise. Um, firstly, by getting some mechanical work done to check which cases have been commented on, cited, etc., etc. And then we had a um, team per chapter uh, looking at it, talking about it, uh, then editing it, then it going through three different, three different filters by the end felt like an awful lot but it did mean that we kept the, the style of the book what it meant was that some people uh, and, and when you have a lot number of people involved keeping the style and the quality right is a difficult but b very important we ended up with some chapters that needed much more work than others anyone who wants to do a minute textual analysis could look at the chapter on bribery which i was solely responsible for and I think there are three changes. It may be, maybe, maybe more than that. But uh, and one of those was suggested by Richard in his rewrite. Um, and um, um, whereas, for example, chapter eight, just looking at it, um, mistake, misrepresentation, and frustration had a bigger rewrite than others. So I think I think. Mm -hmm. it, but we basically, Richard and I, ran the coordination together. And as deadlines approached, we ended up um, ensuring that. Um, uh, between us, we read them all, worked on them all, and then moved them back between us. Mm -hmm. I think we were in panic in mode most words, of the time. In other words, Richard gave you the section on antiquities clauses. <laughs> <laughs> but, but it is, it is, it is, I mean, Richard's, Richard's right. We all know that with other books, we'd, we have to avoid it for this one. But the original author had a style and an approach. And you've got to be very careful that you try and hang on to that style and approach uh, as you evolve and as other people help you with it. Mm. Um, and I think I, I, I think we've not done too badly on that. Though I think inevitably, when you are doing the, the rewrite element and not just the update element, there's more scope for that to go to get variable. And we're very conscious of that, were we? You've got a big team working on the book, so that that. Um keeping consistency in in not just quality but style must be really challenging did, yeah. did you work by having a style guide or did you well we did in the end <laughs> you did by the end you yes. worked out what the style was by the end well we worked out the fact that we needed one by the end but of course like all these things deadlines come now the way we did it was we had a, a four level approach Level one was the mechanical checking of the cases and the statutes and the articles. Level two was a junior member of chambers, much in the way that the six in Keating did at the start, went through looking at what might be done. Level three was then um, uh, uh, it, it being edited according to the style. And then level four was essentially me and Richard going back through it. So we had, we, we had that process. I mean, like all these things, now I've done it once, I'll know how to do it next time. 
Um, and I, I think that the pitfalls, one also learns, you know, the pitfalls are that somebody takes a look at it and decides that they want to rewrite a bit and it doesn't stand out with the rest. But we were very lucky that we, that our level four process, I think worked very nicely. I mean, Richard, I don't know whether you think I'm overstating it, but I think we did manage that. Others will judge how much we succeeded. I think we went through the right process. I think we went through the right process, but we were actually very lucky with the quality of the people who, who, um, who, were, who were doing it. I mean, it's just remarkable, actually. Yeah. I mean, one thing, I, I, I put this question to both of you because it's an experience that um, I had, or would have had to some extent, when, when we continued editing Keating, which was how to direct the research that was going to be done in order to feed into the four-stage process that you've just you've just identified, um, and there are different ways of doing it. There's a, there's a wholly mechanical approach, which is just to say, look up every case and see if it's been referred to anywhere, and then there's a rather more engaged approach, which is to um, follow follow through the cases and see what the updates may be did you did you direct your teams in that way or in in one of those ways uh, yeah, there um, were three, to get their input i was about to talk over you again and i was i was awaiting my admonishment no, to do that <laughs> yes. um the, the, there were three th three 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 techniques one was the mechanical one which when Keating was done in the fifth edition involved going through physically the, the law reports indices, now obviously capable of being done online. Second, and this was an exercise I did myself, I went through every Con LR case, every BLR case, um, and one or two other publications in the last, since the, the um, third edition was published, and categorized them by chapter, and therefore gave direction to those who are going to be involved. Uh, and thirdly, we then had discussions with each, each, everyone involved in each chapter about the direction it might take. Um, and you did find, it was very interesting, you found lots of cases in the BLRs that hadn't been thrown up by the mechanical exercise mm -hmm. of looking at what had been referred to and what had been identified. And I also found, cards on table face up, I found it personally going through six years of BLR and Con LR, seven years, whatever number it was, very interesting and revealing because actually when you do that, you see the trends, you see the personalities, you see the way in which the cases evolve. Partly, in, interestingly enough, directed by the selection of cases by those who edit Con LR and those who edit BLR, but certainly, and that then helped you to feed into the team and of course, because of track changes, you're able to look at the alterations that then you make or that they make, so that at the end, you um, at the end you were able to um, do a comparison. What, what we did was we did the track changes and then accepted all, and then went back to compare right. So you could then actually have the two side by side and see exactly what you'd done. And I, I, I think that worked quite nicely. But Paul, Paul, just picking up on that, I mean, that is one of the things that, uh, I mean, it's trite to say that if you write a book about a subject, you learn a lot, but but you, you do, and you learn, obviously, hopefully, you know, the, the basic areas, but you do come across cases, both in, both in when you're doing it originally, and then when you're doing the updates. And sometimes when you're doing the updates, a case is brought to your attention that actually was some years ago that you've simply never seen before yeah, for whatever reason. Um, and, and, and in adjudication, this happens particularly with Scottish cases because some of them, some of their cases have been very important. Uh, and um, um, you, you, you do learn, you, you discover something that you simply didn't know. And, and, uh, <laughs> in, certainly in my case, that's quite a common experience, but also a very useful one. Yeah. 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 Um, Mike, you, you, I said at the beginning, your, your book has one edition so far, so you haven't been through this process. Um, are you planning on doing it? And if you do, do you think you'll do it on your own or, or surround yourself with a, a team of, <laughs> of 
of enthusiastic young members of chambers or whoever or paul i'm sure paul's available well I, w I was asked to do it again a couple of years ago but events have kind of conspired against us i must admit it's uh, the pandemic and uh and Brexit caused, I was going to wait to obviously we, what was going to happen. As, as you know, the Rome exactly. 1 regulation has been kept as part of this special retained EU law. But the reality is my book is 900 pages. That's half the length of the original draft. And so I have piles of stuff that I accumulated that at the time I thought when I did this massive edit may not be relevant, but now we've left the EU and these historical travaux preparatoire issues may become more relevant because we won't have access to those yeah. materials in the same way. Mm. And at the time when I wrote it, of course, they, they hadn't even defined what a contractual obligation was for the purposes of the regulation. So I have been keeping up to date, but I think the reality is sometimes you look back at a book and you think, well, this chapter, I just need to come in a different way and uh, or, or improve the way people react to it. Now, uh, on the question, one chapter, one example was uh, when you haven't made a choice of law, when they had the Rome Convention in 1980, they used this method of asking, well, who's the characteristic performer of this contract? And where's the characteristic performance? Which was a Swiss law concept. So being a nutter, I went and researched all the Swiss law background to all this and how it had been imported into all this. And I was really proud of these like 20 pages about how all this involved Swiss law and how they made a complete pig's ear of this, that and the other and how it had been adopted in the Rome Convention. And then when a German reviewer of the book, who was very favorable to the book, said, well, there isn't very much on characteristic performance. And I realized actually in the index, there isn't this section wasn't marked up. I hadn't spotted that. So there's also things you can come back and you, you want to check. You think, God, I spent ages looking at all that Swiss stuff and you haven't even read it. <laughs> so um, there are things that you want to improve. I probably, yeah, I will do it because I think you, you know, you, you owe it to yourself in a way to, to, uh, and to your people who have used it. It's one of the great, and I'm sure everyone who's written a book, it's one of the great things is when you see it cited with approval in the Supreme Court or the Advocate General's referring to the European Court, in my case, I'm chuffed to bits. You know, it's, you actually feel that's do you, do you keep Do you keep a sort of little um, record as you get of, of things as they happen? You, I go back periodically. Which... I would go back to say the CGU cases every month and see what the cases are on Rome One, Rome Two, and the main source of data for Rome One, of course, will be the Brussels regulation because that's the contractual uh, matters relating to contract will be applied effectively by analogy the factual circumstances there. Because one of the things that I'm thinking of doing for the next edition is. Um, and I think it's a consequence of the, the way the, the world has changed. Because we always see the law reports online and in the law tell, as they used to be, uh, of blessed memory, up, daily updates, because we used to see, um, um, we're used to seeing all of that and hearing about cases in real time, as it were, yeah. um, one doesn't necessarily go back to the reports when the, month, when the monthly or weekly parts appear. Uh, and I think that that's something to, to, to be encouraged. The late great Donald Keating used to keep a card index next to his uh, next to his desk, and I think I, I'm going to try and adopt for the next edition the sort of a virtual card index. Do, do you think, though, it's just possibly slightly moving away from the topic, but um, you've identified Paul going back through particular reports, and and you were saying a moment ago you can see trends in the law being affected in part by the way the reporters have selected the cases that they're going to, to put into those. At the same time, we've got, as you say, the almost real-time reporting, virtually everything on Bailey or Lawtel as it was, or Westlaw as it is now. Um, it, do you think we're sometimes overwhelmed by every case being reported as if it's got some great point of law in it, when half the time, and I can tell you quite frankly from this side of the, the bench, that you think all you've done is apply a perfectly um, standard principle and the case is of no interest to anyone, uh, apart from the parties, obviously, and you're suddenly asked to approve the transcript of it uh, as if it's regarded of some considerable import. Um, from the perspective generally, but also from the perspective of updating um, texts, do, do you feel we're, we're 
potentially overwhelmed by the case law? I'm absolutely sure we are. I think that the bit that for me, one of I, I went and did because it was easier and quieter, and I felt academic and intellectual. I went and sat in the Inns Library to go through the BLRs and the Con LRs, and I. I think one's got to accept that with the editors of those publications, there is an element of personal quirkiness uh, and that there is some selections that are to do with the identity of the editors and their interests, but it doesn't affect the overall thrust, which is that you get the more important cases um, and the, uh, also with headnotes. So you are, you're able to think more strategically about it than if you're just getting the Lawtel Westlaw Bailey, what um, Bailey approach, and I think you do get a, a real sense of you know, the every, also the volume of case on particular topics. You'd see phrases when um, there were topic adjudication was you know the absolute rage for six months, and then suddenly you see a pause and cases about mistake. Really quite quite interesting to see how it all plays through. Mm -hmm. see, there's a, there's a question. Area. Sorry, sorry, sorry. In my area, it's often keeping up with the academic writings, which is yes. fine in, in English law, but there's an awful lot of written on the continent, which um, if you ever can't get help sleeping through ordinary medication methods, then reading some of these, having these journals next to your bed. I did remember, and when you're writing a book, I'd advise anybody, there's a moment where you think you're definitely going mad. And I remember thinking, walking down the street, oh gosh, I'm glad I remembered that article in that German journal by that Italian law professor, which I downloaded last year. And I thought, no, Michael, it's time to go to the pub. This is, you're reaching overload capacity here. So that's the hard bit. But, book, but, the, but the sort of books that we've all been doing do give you overload because yeah. that, that's one of the reasons why having the team that we've had at 39 doing, do, do, helping us with, with, with Wilmot Smith. Because as you say, you, you are thinking about, you are walking down the street and all you are thinking about is, have I got the interchange between force majeure and, and frustration right? Have I got the sort of spin on that? Have I, and have I missed anything? Um, you know, that is, the, it, it, you do get into mental overload. I mean, I have to say, I'm slightly jealous of you and Peter because, you know, uh, your topics are, are so specialist and, and, and confined. Um, for example, I, we, when we're looking at Wilmot Smith, we've got a whole chapter on assignment. Um, and, um, you know, so, some poor person has to update the chapter on assignment whilst thinking about, you know, in the law generally. Uh, and that, that is, that's quite an ask because it involves not just our, our, our area of the world, but nevertheless, you know, cases throughout the world or throughout the divisions on that abstruse subject. The problem you're talking about, a... oh, sorry. sorry the, pro you the problem you were talking about with updating, I think has been true for a long time. It's, it was less of a problem in the first and second edition because, dare I say it, the TCC was incoherent. Um, and you had to... Before I don't think it's time, I hope. Sorry, what? Before, Before I don't no, think it's time. No, no. And, and it was when Rupert, Rupert came and took it over. And if you notice his judgments, uh, in, in virtually any case, the principles are as follows. And what he was doing was codifying mm -hmm. and directing the judges below him to make sure that the, there was clarity. And so for me, it was easier in the first edition and the second edition, because I had to take my, uh, take my lead from Rupert, who was gathering together the Tower of Babel and promulgating it. Now it's, now it's, um, it's the problem you're talking about when you say, well, is this something new and query whether it is or it isn't. And that's made, sorry. No, I was going to say that there's a question that's come up, which is that there's another one which I'll come back to in a minute. But there's a question that's come up in the Q and A, which is quite pertinent to this this topic, which is whether there's a difficult, particular difficulty. And I think um, Paul and Richard, this applies to your book more than um, it does to to my computers, um, in identifying non-construction related case law that that impacts on what you're talking about and needs to be taken account of to to um, in the updating process, because that takes you outside just looking at specialist law reports or what's been decided in the TCC and takes you into um, all sorts of other areas, not even necessarily just the commercial court. Um, how do you go about it? Or how did you go about addressing that sort of issue? 
Well, you're looking for the cases that the um, editing process of seeing what's been commented on has not picked up. Um, so if it's been picked up by, by the editing process, you, you get a bit of a clue. But I regard it as, as my responsibility and that of those helping with particular chapters, editing particular chapters or whatever role they were taking, to look at these topics in other textbooks to, to get a feel for what is being dealt with. And, and that's one of the things I found personally so rewarding is, you know, when, when we were doing Pan um, McAlpine and Panatown and all those cases, I knew all about the law of assignment and, and no loss because I was dealing with it every day. Being able to get in back into those areas of law when you don't actually need them, I thought was, a, was particularly beneficial. And it's right that, you know, you look at, um, less so in the construction field, but I, my, my familiarity with the sort of tone of um, contracts came very much from looking at Chitty and things like that, which I think is, is helps you to cross fertilize. You obviously form your own view, but it sends you in the right direction. Yeah, and if you want to, for example, know about liquidated damages deeply, do a deep dive on a difficult question, you could do worse than look at Scruton on charter parties yeah. because liquidated damages demurrage very, you know, so well, well Richard, 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 that's a very controversial thing to say, that, that the Supreme Court will so shortly, I suspect, discuss the link between those two when it considers the appeal in a case called Triple Point, uh, in which our chairman was the trial judge, in, which I didn't appear in in front of her, um, but where the Supreme Court is currently considering its judgment and we anxiously await its outcome. And in which, as I say, at every possible opportunity, the issue on liquidated damages wasn't pleaded and wasn't argued before me. <laughs> no, and it led to a marvellous interchange between me and Lord Leggett, where he said, if this point was so obvious, Mr Darling, why wasn't it raised in front of the judge? And I explained that there was a dynamic in the Court of Appeal and the judge in the Court of Appeal, and indeed that one of the reasons that I was now involved was because this point had been Brought, brought up in the Court of Appeal, and it was thought that my construction law experience might be of help. It led to me being put very charmingly in my place by, my, by our opponent, James Howells, who said that he'd been in throughout because he had some expertise from the beginning, which I thought was a very charming way of <laughs> putting me in my place. But that, that topic, that's quite an interesting illustration because in that case, we, and it's quite right that the case that the point wasn't argued in front of the trial judge and it was invited to be argued by the court of appeal we did then dive around jurisdictions um both uh, in the uk and in america um and I, I i think that when you find out about a point of this sort this sort of book gives you the chance uh, um not just the supreme court to do that sort of exercise and that's why having your team resourced by this big team of enthusiastic and clever people is one of the keys to getting the basis done. Okay. Um, there was a question I said I was going to come back to. Um, I, I'm going to slightly ask in a slightly different way from, from the way it's been posed in the Q&A, but um, your books are all hardback books. Um, any enthusiasm for publishing them in uh, paperback or uh, not so people can read them on the tube, but so that they're more um, accessible um, price-wise, if nothing else, to a different readership, particularly a student readership? Well, you, of course, have given me the in to the commercial, which is that everyone attending today will be getting the opportunity to buy the book at a 30% discount. Some might say that the extra discount is scant compensation for having to listen to us, but nevertheless, everyone who uh, signed up, let alone attended. Um, but you're still talking about a book that is even with that discount on our case, going to be um, around the 200 pound mark. Um, I'm going to give copies of it or give copies to my old college at Oxford so that, uh, that uh, at least one student will see it. I, I, I think that there's a lot in this that would benefit from the wider market. Um, and um, I think that obviously we're much, much cheaper than many other equivalent books. Um, there, there are, um, there are some without naming names or naming numbers. Uh, I decided to buy copies of various of them and uh, thought the naught had been put on the end by accident. Um, but I, th I think that wider accessibility is good. I think that the need for the 
the online bit, particularly for the for the uh, the young, is maybe one of the ways to do it and subscriptions. But yeah. certainly, I do think it, it. Obviously, we would say this, wouldn't we? That the but all three of our books would benefit from a, a wider audience, and that people, um, whether they're doing academic stuff um, on construction law or on contract generally, would get something out of it. Publishers don't seem very keen, though. <laughs> I'm lowering no. the prices, <laughs> I'm afraid, because there isn't there isn't a, a huge market in our in our field. No, um, and, and, and also we all know that um, you know these are expensive things to produce um, because you have to have an editor, you have to have a you know once you get it to the publisher, you've then got all of this toing and froing, correcting it, um, proofreading it, formatting it, cross referencing it. Which I have to say was for me one of the big surprises as to how yeah. time consuming and difficult cross-referencing is. I'm not a man who's known for cross-references normally, but I'm afraid I had to be this time. Hmm. Yeah, I think it's, it's very easy, isn't it, to underestimate quite how much work, not just in the writing of it, but the production of um, books of this nature um, involves. I can tell you though, uh, Mr. Darling, that one of your instructing solicitors, um, uh, it is concerned, to put it lightly, that you didn't bother to tell him he could get a discount before he went out and bought the book at full price. Yes, there are. I, I have I have had a couple of calls to that effect, and I'm going to have to buy some very nice lunches so as to compensate those um, who uh, who uh, who. Um, indeed, I've had a couple of sort of emails that describe them as tart would be slightly <laughs> slight uh, would be slightly harsh, but certainly you can see that. Um, 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 and indeed. Um, um, it, it, it's worse than that. Um, someone I know has had a present made to him of one of these books, which, as he said, was was a little bit late. There you go. Um, well, I think we said we would um, run for about 45 minutes, and um, we're now at 50. Um, so uh, would any of you like to share with us a final piece of wisdom or experience um, before we wind up our session? Well, could I just say one slightly emotional thing? Uh, forgive me, I'm, um, um, if I'd be allowed to. Uh, I'm very grateful, obviously. You haven't to, won to... an award yet, mate. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, when you do it, you can, when you do it, you can thank the little people, but until you get there. No, no, I'm not thanking you. I, 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 I'm very grateful to everyone, obviously. But um, obviously, it's great to have had the seminar with, with uh, Neris, uh, Michael and Peter, but I wanted just, if I could, to say a word about Richard and say how grateful I am to him having invited me to be involved in it. When I arrived as his pupil in 1984 uh, in 22 old buildings, little did I realize that in 2021, uh, I would be editing a book with him. It's been an absolute joy. Um, well, a joy most of the time, always a joy with him, but nevertheless, a, a complicated process. And I just wanted to say how grateful I am to him for having involved me in it. Oh, you're, you're very sweet, Paul, and I'll get emotional too. It's been a privilege having you. Thank you all very much. It is the point, Richard, of uh, our webinar was to mark the publication of the fourth edition. Um, I think you shared with us a lot about how the book came to be and how personal it is um, and that's a very um, personal note to end on. Um, thank you all um, Lord Justice Coulson, Paul Darling QC, Richard Wilmot Smith QC, Michael McParlin QC um, for um, your fascinating insight into um, how you've gone about producing um, three fantastic books um, 30 percent only available off Wilmot Smith on construction contracts at the moment. Uh, get your copy as soon as possible. Uh, and thank you all very much for your participation. Thanks very much. Bye bye. Thank you very much. Bye bye.